All right. Okay. How's everyone doing today? I myself am not doing not doing necessarily too good. I just found out that a relative I'm very close to is in intensive care. So I might have to and stream a little bit earlier than I want to. Depends on what goes on. Let's see that you're doing all right, at least. <laughs> oh, so, I guess I'll have to see what happens. Yeah, well, they're like 70 or 80 years old plus. And apparently, uh, haven't, like, they were doing good yesterday and today, and then, and then they were, uh, she was brought into intensive care today, and, like, she's been, uh, Like, watched constantly by nurses and, you know, all that. But, like, she's been apparently subdued and, like, constantly awake and, like, constantly out of it. So she's probably, like, on a lot of medication right now. So... If I end stream early, that's probably why... So, on that note, we're probably going to cover some more updates from the Russia-Ukraine situation. <laughs> Yesterday, Trudeau has announced a uh, military extension in, in Latvia, so take a watch and... See if that, it's yeah, it's it's absolutely. Family absolutely does come first. Ukraina ir saliedējis NATO partneris. Šodien es gribu izteikt paldies mūsu partneriem, kas šodien ar mani šeit stāv, tātad Jensam Saltenbergam, NATO ģenerāla sekretāram, Džastanam Trudeau, Kanādas premjera ministram, un Pedro Sanchez, Spānijas premjera ministram, par to, ka šodien bija iespēja mums visiem četriem šeit āda šos tikties. Runa par to, ka NATO ir jāstiprins austrumu plāngs. So, the NATO... Šodien es varu teikt, ka mēs redzam... NATO, la, or NATO Latvija, kas notiek pateicoties tā... Canada and Spain are meeting to discuss... ...stiprins savu karavīru uh, tehniku pārpūtni te pati... ...military... Like a, an extension in the uh, military mission... ...in Latvija to see what goes on. Tātad Latvijas karaspēks, Latvijas karavīri ir stiprināti pastāvīgi par even... desmit vēl citiem NATO sabiedrotējiem. Un vēl, kā mēs zinām, šobrīd Latvijā vēl ir papildus 11. papildus spēks no Amerikas Savienotājiem valstīm. 
kuri arī šodien mēs tieši redzējām militāros, militārās mācības, kur tas notiek procesā, un mēs redzējām, kad Latvijas karavīri kopā ar Kanādas karavīriem, ar Spānijas karavīriem, ar vēl daudzu citu valsts karavīriem un ar ASV sabiedrotiem kopā veica apmācības stiprināt tā skaitā tieši Latvijas kā NATO dalībās Pasam. reālo aizsardzību. Mēs esam salīdzinoši maza valsts, bet mēs esam daļa no... I don't speak Latvijas, so... I don't really know what he's saying. Prime Minister Karins, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, Prime Minister Chances, uh, their uh, Christian Minister uh, Justin their Pedro. It's great to be together with all of you here today. This uh, demonstrates really NATO solidarity that we stand together uh, facing uh, a critical moment for our uh, security caused by the brutal invasion of uh, Russia of uh, a peaceful uh, country in Europe, Ukraine. President Putin's war on Ukraine has shattered peace in Europe. It has shaken the international order and it continues to take devastating toll on the Ukrainian people. But Putin seriously underestimated Ukraine and he seriously underestimated the strength and the unity of NATO and of our friends and partners around the world. We have imposed unprecedented uh, costs on Russia. We have stepped up our support for Ukraine, helping to uphold its right to self-defense. And uh, we have implemented historic reinforcements on NATO's collective defense. With thousands more troops reinforcing the eastern part of our alliance including here in Latvia. I strongly welcome <sighs> that allies, including Canada, Spain and the United States, are deploying hundreds more troops uh, to our multinational presence here at the Adashi uh, base in Latvia. Like, so Justin, uh, Pedro, thank you. I don't understand what they're trying to do. Like, if they do, like, all-out warfare, it's game over right but like they're not going to because if they do that would just be world war 3 and that's game over for everyone right so it would be the it's the same thing as like a no fly zone there as well so I don't understand like what they're trying to do. For your personal leadership and your commitment to our collective security. Canada has led NATO's battle group in Latvia for years with skill and dedication. A powerful demonstration of your commitment to transatlantic security. Spain is leading by example by deploying additional troops, ships and jets to strengthen our defensive posture in Europe. It was really an honor uh, to meet uh, your forces here today from both sides of the Atlantic. They represent the spirit of all our uh, allies, all for one and one for all. NATO is a defensive alliance. We do not. I mean, it, what's this? Doesn't seem like anyone has a plan to defuse this situation at all. I mean, they really don't, and like, there isn't really too much that they can do, anyways, because like, if NATO gets involved, and like, that isn't um, a proxy war in Ukraine. Because if they did, like, boots on, boots on the ground warfare, it's game over. It doesn't matter. Because then that's, that's nuclear holocaust, which understandably a lot of people don't want. And that is kind of true. Like, I kind of wish that the U.S. would actually do something. Like, 
diplomacy wise because like you want to try and diffuse and have and exhaust all your uh diplomatic ties first before you actually get involved in a conflict but like it would be such a big disaster that if uh they actually did end up doing something like that because you know nuclear holocaust <coughs> see conflict with russia our ultimate responsibility is to keep our one billion citizens safe this means we must and like uh, of course like places like spain germany and france would have a lot more to do when it comes to the uh a lot more care when it comes to um what happens in ukraine because they'd like europe will have regardless of what happens europe will have a uh another instance of afghanistan on their hands except that instead of in the middle east which a lot of european nations and north american nations don't care about they'll end up having a bunch of you know ukrainians in uh inside of it the conflict so I'm like that's just inherently going to be bad for for europe because like look at the situation with afghanistan and then look at the surrounding nations and what happened to them right impossible to prevent the conflict from spreading beyond ukraine and our presence here in Latvia sends a unmistakable message of unity and resolve. Our commitment to Article 5 of the Washington Treaty is absolute. And we will do whatever it takes to protect and defend all allies. So, Christianes, Justin, and Pedro, at this dangerous moment for our security, we stand united for our people and our values. Europe and North America together in NATO. Thank you. Paldies, Lūdzu vārds Kanādas premjerinī Jean uh, Justinam Trudeau. Bonjour tout le monde. Je suis très heureux d'être ici avec vous aujourd'hui. I'd like to first thank Prime Minister Karin. Oh, I thought he was going to talk in French the entire time. I was really hoping that that wouldn't have been the case. Uh, thank you so much for your warm welcome, as well we continue to strengthen the relationship between Canada and Latvia. Prime Minister Sanchez, Pedro, it's good to see you. I know how important the contribution of Spain is to the success of the mission here. NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg, thank you, Jens, for being with us today. It's extremely important. NATO truly is multinational. It was absolutely amazing to see the culminating military exercise of our troops from different nations, including those of Canada, Latvia, and Spain, training together. It was great to be here, and I'm also very happy to be joined today uh, by Minister Anand, our Minister of National Defense, and the Chief of Defense Staff, General Eyre. We had a very productive day today. On top of my different bilateral meetings with uh, Christianis, Prime Minister Karens, Prime Minister Sanchez, and NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg, I also met with President Levitz of Latvia to discuss Ukraine and a broad range of topics. In addition, this morning, uh, Christianis was able to organize that we were joined virtually by the Prime Minister of Estonia, Kaya Palas, and the Prime Minister of Lithuania, Ingrida Simoni. We agreed to deepen the partnership between Canada and the Baltic countries, especially at this time of uncertainty. Ici, au camp Adazi, j'ai aussi la chance de rencontrer plusieurs membres des forces armées canadiennes et des autres pays de l'OTAN. Je les ai remerciés personnellement pour leur travail remarquable et leur professionnalisme. Last month, Canada announced the deployment of up to 460 members of the Canadian Armed Forces to NATO through Operation Reassurance. This announcement includes more troops here in Latvia, as well as the deployment of an additional frigate in Mer I mean, like, what do they intend on actually doing with this, though? Like, there isn't really too much that they can do, right? 
so like i honestly don't even know if this is worth it at this point like i understand that you want to do your oh come on that you want to do your um your diplomatic ties when it comes to you know this which i get but there's like only so much that you can actually do with this though maritime patrol aircraft a total of 540 CAF personnel are now deployed here in latvia and approximately 130 more will join oh. in the coming weeks well today i can further announce an early multi-year renewal of operation reassurance to support nato in central and eastern europe this mission was set to expire next year and in light of the situation in europe we decided to renew it ahead of schedule operation reassurance is the calf support to nato's assurance and deterrence measures the troops here are not only defending latvia or eastern europe they're defending all NATO allies, including Canada. We're defending our freedom and our security. That's why this work is so important, especially in the face of continued Russian aggression. Aujourd'hui, je peux annoncer que le Canada va renouveler l'opération Réassurance pour plusieurs années afin de soutenir l'OTAN, en particulier sur le plan Est. On va continuer d'être là pour défendre la démocratie en Europe et partout dans le monde. Demain, je serai à Berlin où je vais rencontre, rencontrer le chancelier Scholz. Et merci encore à nos forces de nous accueillir aujourd'hui. Today, in particular, during International Women's Day, I want to thank all the brave women who serve in the Canadian oh, Army. Oh God, he's such a lib. Why does he have to bring up International Women's Day on something like this? Like, no one cares about that right now. Like, oh, liberals are so annoying. Forces for their that has nothing to do with this right now. All the women who serve in armed forces around the world. Canada will continue to be an ally and partner to help defend our shared values, and we will continue to be there for Ukraine. And now I'd like to turn uh, the mic over to uh, Canada's Minister of National Defense, Anita Hanna. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur le Premier ministre. C'est un grand honneur pour moi d'être ici avec vous, avec nos forces armées canadiennes, avec le chef d'état-major de la défense et avec nos partenaires, particulièrement cette journée internationale de femmes. Thank you, Prime Minister. It is an honor for me to be here. That's something that I really find annoying in Canadian politics is that they just switch between French and English. I wish that they would just like pick one. Here, especially on International Women's Day. J'étais ici il y a un mois. I was here less than one month ago, and it is so good to be back here today to see the troops and to thank them for their service. My visit in early February and a number of engagements thereafter, including the recent NATO defense minister's meeting in Brussels, made clear that operations like Operation Reassurance represent the very best that NATO has to offer. This is the message that I hear in every meeting and continue to hear. In response to this message, and to Putin's further aggression, we announced on February 22nd up to 460 more troops to NATO through Operation Reassurance, on top of the 500 already here, and the deployment of, as the Prime Minister mentioned, an additional frigate and a maritime patrol aircraft to reinforce NATO's eastern flank. Now, as the Prime Minister just announced, we are going even further. Today, we are renewing our support by extending Operation Reassurance mission one year ahead of time. <sighs> this announcement reflects our deep commitment to the long-term security, stability, and interoperability of the NATO alliance. J'aimerais remercier nos forces armées canadiennes pour leur dévouement et de continuer de 
l'engagement du Canada en Lettonie pour le plan de l'Est de l'OTAN et pour la sécurité, la dissuasion et la stabilité mondiale. I want to conclude by expressing my gratitude to our Canadian Armed Forces by continuing to put service before self and for continuing Canada's enduring commitment to Latvia, to NATO's eastern flank, and to our collective security at home and abroad. And I extend this appreciation to all who serve and who are here today. Thank you. Merci. Fabius. I now am happy to pass the mic over to Prime Minister Sancho. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister, thank you very much, my dear friends. Uh, as uh, Prime Minister Trudeau said, uh, today, 8 March, uh, should have been a day of celebration of women and girls in Ukraine. Unfortunately... 100%. It, it, it 100%, though. But, like... Due to, you know, fucking Russia's bloodthirsty conquering, like, it's just led to so much unnecessary death and violence and everything. Like, it's... There's no, there's no reason for this. Unnecessary bloodshed. Yeah, speaking one, langu one language would be... Speaking one language the entire time keeps things more focused. I understand that Canada has two native languages, but English is the one most spoken in the world at the moment. I mean, yeah, but like, I understand that there's probably like uh, French people here as well, but like, I don't think that the Spanish uh, prime minister will do the same thing. I guess we'll have to wait and see, but yeah, it is kind of annoying. Brutal aggression is forcing them to flee their country or fight uh, for their lives. I would like to pay an homage uh, today to all of them and we are sure that we will uh, stand by their side. I would like to thank the President and the Prime Minister of Latvia for organizing this visit. I am very happy to share it with my friend uh, Justin, Prime Minister Trudeau, whose country commands this uh, battle group uh, and this NATO Secretary General. Jens Stoltenberg. We are here to support to our Baltic allies and friends in these very difficult times and to send a very clear message to President Putin. NATO allies. Are I mean, like, Putin already gave his demands, which, like, most of them are psychotic and, like, are not going to happen. Like, the denazification of Ukraine, uh, the, recognition, uh, the recognition of. Uh, the two easternmost states of Ukraine as independent nations and a bunch of other like stuff like that like at most I can see like some of the more basic ones being addressed like the like the recognition of the uh, of the two uh, eastern states as its own separate entity which I, I honestly don't even think that will happen to be honest but I have been wrong on a lot of uh, the Russia-Ukraine stuff, mostly just because I haven't really been keeping up with it too much. Because it's it just drains me. But like the like the denazification of Ukraine is like is ridiculous, right? Because like fuck, everywhere has their fucking Nazi problems. Like even Russia has their Nazi problems. So uh, like it's just not gonna happen. Are united. And the transatlantic bond is stronger than ever. I want to insist once again: our main commitment is with peace. NATO is a defensive alliance. As uh, I mean, NATO was only created to defeat the USSR, and like Russia is only justifying its existence with this unnecessarily aggression and bloodshed. As the Secretary General of NATO has said, and all our actions so far are deterrence efforts to avoid confrontation. Spanish troops are the second largest contingent here in Adassin's battle group, 
Now I want to recognize our soldiers' dedication, solidarity, and professionalism. We are increasing our deployment by with uh, 157 additional soldiers, and we are also ready to fulfill our commitment through the graduate response plans. I would like to reaffirm Spain's unwearing support to Ukraine. We have delivered several uh, tons of humanitarian aid and military equipment. Spain will also be up uh, to the challenge uh, that represents uh, the dreadful humanitarian crisis uh, caused by this terrible war with over 1.7 million people fleeing their country. We will stay by the Ukrainian government and by the Ukrainian people to withstand Putin's unjustified attack. This is an act of aggression, not only to Europe's security, but also to what Europe represents, which is democracy, multilateralism, yeah, and freedom. Thank you. Well, for this, we would like to ask you that you have a very good question Good afternoon, gentlemen. Murray Brewster with CBC News. Prime Minister Trudeau, allies have been shipping to Ukraine. They got the CBC News guys. I wonder if we're going to see like any any more like legendary people I, or reporters or anything i doubt it because of how dire the situation is but like you gotta have a little bit of fun right it's like as horrible as the uh the situation is like we should still like make some memes and everything about it and i've only seen like two good memes aircraft weapons and anti tank weapons, Canada sent anti tank weapons. Both of those capabilities are in short supply in the Canadian military. The Canadian Army does not have a dedicated surface to air defense system. Will your government commit to an urgent procurement to cover those capability gaps? And will your government commit to meeting NATO's benchmark standard of 2% of GDP in defense spending? First of all, we understand. Am I missing something? My knowledge, there is no positive outcome either way. I mean, it's it's because like Putin is being a bloodthirsty fucking moron. Like, none of this actually makes sense. Like, like I understand s sort of on like why he's doing it, but like at the same time, it's just like no, there's no fucking benefit to war outside of. The fucking, you know, people that are making fucking, and companies that are making shit tons of money off of war. Because war is incredibly profitable. That's why um, a lot of gun manufacturers and uh, aviation companies make, or get so many fucking grants in the, from the U.S. government to make a bunch of fucking weapons and shit. But I, yeah, I do understand. I, I do completely agree. Like, there is no benefit to this. Like, the Russian people don't want this. The fucking Ukrainians don't want this. Nobody wants this. Like, it benefits no one. Uh, that uh, is presented right now in the world with Ukrainians standing strong against this illegal Russian invasion. Uh, and that's why we have sent aid, we have sent weapons, we will continue to send support uh, to Ukrainians as they stand to defend not just their country, but defend democracy, defend the values that underpin democracy, and in fact, defend us all. Uh, those weapons are much more useful right now and in the coming weeks in the hands of Ukrainian soldiers fighting for their lives uh, than they would be in Canadian hands. But of course, we need to make sure we replace those weapons rapidly and that we continue to invest in the equipment uh, that leads uh, our armed forces uh, to be able to continue to contribute, not just 
uh, in places like here in Latvia, but everywhere around the world uh, where we are called on to do. I had an excellent conversation with uh, Secretary General uh, Stoltenberg earlier uh, this afternoon in which uh, I talked about, indeed, uh, our approach to continuing to invest uh, in our military and making sure that Canada is always there to stand up. En français, Prime Minister. Uh, nous allons uh, toujours uh, chercher à contribuer plus sur le plan. On pense, je pense qu'on voit à quel point c'est important d'être présent pour défendre nos démocraties, mais évidemment, uh, les appuis qu'on envoie immédiatement en Ukraine, incluant uh, des, des armes, des armements, uh, sont utiles non seulement pour défendre l'Ukraine dans l'immédiat, mais sont en train de se battre pour défendre nos démocraties à travers le monde. Oui, bonjour M. Trudeau, Laurence Martin de Radio-Canada. Euh, la Russie a réactivé plusieurs de ses bases de la guerre froide en Arctique. Et récemment, ils ont aussi fait des exercices militaires dans la région. Bon, vous annoncez aujourd'hui un prolongement de la mission ici en Lettonie, mais en Arctique, est-ce que vous pensez qu'on est vulnérable et est-ce que vous allez renforcer notre présence militaire là-bas? Ça fait plusieurs années euh, qu'on est en train d'investir dans notre présence militaire euh, partout dans le monde, mais particulièrement aussi dans l'Arctique. Euh, mais sur, euh, sur ce point-là, ça me ferait grand plaisir de passer la parole à notre ministre de la Défense, Joe Anderson. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Premier ministre. Bien sûr, euh, la souveraineté et la protection de notre Arctique Uh, Mission is the communist uh, brother. Uh, I love auto-generation. Uh, <laughs> like, what are they supposed to do at this point? Like, all that they can keep doing is like funneling weapons and aid to Ukrainians and like hope and pray that they can push off the Ukrainians and all that. But like, there isn't really too much that, you know, NATO f can fucking do. So like increasing troop counts around like in Latvia and stuff, like I don't understand why, I, I don't understand how this is really going to help though. pour le, le protection renouvelable dans l'Arctique. Donc, pour ça, euh, j'ai parlé beaucoup avec mon homologue dans les États-Unis et nous avons décidé de euh, travailler ensemble pour euh, la protection de notre continent et aussi de notre monde. Euh, donc, le euh, NORAD modernization, ça c'est une euh, chose très, très importante pour moi et pour notre gouvernement aussi. Et nous allons avoir une, euh, une approche robuste dans le court terme sur ça. Et ça c'est une chose très importante pour nous et pour le gouvernement du Canada. Merci beaucoup. So far, well, I'm going to make a lot of um, informative, so I think on behalf of all the Spanish journalists here today. So, um, so far, the response to sanctions has not stopped Putin. I mean, like, of, of course they wouldn't stop Putin, though, because, like, all that the sanctions are doing are just hurting the Russian people. Like, I understand that you want to try and, you know, prevent Russia from funding its military and shit, but, like, the sanctions aren't really helping, but we will be getting to a sanction that might help. It's a very big double-edged sword. It's what I had talked about not too long ago on um, which sanctions they should use. But we'll have to wait and see with that. And like, we'll talk about that after this, this, uh, this deployment of more troops into Latvia.
which I honestly don't really think will do anything. Um, what should be the path from now on? How far can NATO go? And how far can the European Union go as well? Do you consider the possibility of stopping buying oil and gas from Russia, just like the US has proposed? And do you think that Algerian gas could be the solution to... to and that is what he is. Uh, that is what I was referring to the, the buying of Russian oil and gas. We will be ta talking about that a little bit later after this. So there's like that's mostly like what all their export is coming from. But like in the situation of Europe, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Supply all your European countries. And Prime Minister Sanchez, as far as Spain goes, uh, what steps are you willing to take to respond to the economic impact of the war in our country? Is it possible to use the loans of the next generation funds? And is it possible to lower fuel taxes? And we would be very grateful if you could have an answer in Spanish as well. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for your uh, questions. Uh, first of all, I think, I think it's crucial to, to be united. This is what we are showing today with the Prime Ministers of Latvia, Prime Minister of Canada, Secretary General of uh, NATO, Spain, and all the allies uh, uh, in NATO and the uh, European Union. And that is why I think it's important not to, you know, to advance uh, different measures that we are uh, going to, uh, uh, we are going to debate in the, in the Council in, in the coming days in, in, in Paris. But of course, uh, economic sanctions uh, is uh, one of the most uh, powerful means, instruments that we have in order to stop this terrible and unjustified uh, war that Putin is, uh, um, you know, uh, making against uh, against uh, a, a free country such as uh, Ukraine. Uh, secondly, uh, of course, I think it's, it's, uh, it's very important to uh, act uh, regarding the economic impact uh, in Spain and, of course, uh, in the world economy especially in the European economy. I honestly think that the European economy will, especially those that are closer to Ukraine, are going to suffer the most. Like, let's be real. Russia, or uh, not Russia, um, America and Canada have, like, next to no, uh, like, stakes in this war because we're very far away from the fighting. Like I'd even say, I'd even say Britain doesn't really have too much stakes in the war either because like they're not part of the EU or they're not uh, really too dependent on like anything that happens in that area. So we'll have to we'll have to wait and see what the future brings. I get strengths in number. I guess strength in numbers, but thing, but the but is the amount of troops Canada and the other countries are sending out meant to scare Russia? That's the general idea of it, but I honestly don't like if Putin hasn't stopped at this point. I don't think that he will unless it comes like with under uh, underneath like really harsh shanks. Uh, sanctions like the oil and gas for example and when it comes to this like the situation i honestly don't think that it's going to end up affecting them but like the amount of troops like it, it doesn't matter like they could have the the entire military stationed outside in Latvia, but it won't make a difference. Uh, I think it's important to uh, to to act in in different uh, in different dimensions. First of all, the, the multilateral dimensions, and here we have uh, countries that belong to the G7. But of course, at the European level, I think it's important the communication that the Commission has uh, released uh, today regarding the. Uh, energy policy, which is one of uh, the major uh, tools for the economic growth, and of course it, it is already impacting this crisis on the uh, energy prices. 
And, uh, and of course, I think it's important also to have this unity among uh, parties in, uh, in Spain. And of course, this unity that we have shown with the um, um, uh, trade unions and enterprises, uh, first with the pandemic and the response, the economic response to this pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, and of course, uh, nowadays with this very... I mean, like, we're still not out of, out of the pandemic yet either. So, like, it's... We have like two major problems to solve. We have to get out of this pandemic, and then there's the conflict in Ukraine. And like, we should know what to do for the pandemic, but like, you know, the fucking provincial uh, leadership generally wants to care about that because uh, just today. Ontario has announced that they're going to be ending mass mandates shortly, which is idiotic. Go figure, it starts off with Alberta, then it goes to Saskatchewan, then it goes to Manitoba, then it goes to Ontario. I mean, like, of course that would happen. Because they're all fucking conservative premiers, and at this point they're just saying it's too hard. But, like, that's a problem we do need to solve, but we also... There is also like some problems that for this that we need to solve as well. I, I think that America should try to do more diplomatically in order to like have a ceasefire happen. But like the biggest thing that Biden so far has done has been like uh not buying oil and gas from Russia. ...and unjustified war um, uh, led by, by Putin. So this is, this is the question, in, in, uh, or the answer in, Sp in English, and in Spanish I would say, I think the most important thing is to work with the unity of all the countries, all the communities internationals. I think the vote of the General Assembly of the Nations Unidas that we had a few days ago demonstrated that Putin is alone, and that the majority of the world is alone, con Ucrania. Y esa unidad se tiene que demostrar desde el punto de vista eh, de las sanciones económicas, desde el punto de vista de la respuesta que tenemos que dar la comunidad internacional, aislando completamente a Putin, también en sanciones económicas contra él mismo y contra la oligarquía que ha crecido en torno a su régimen y por tanto eh, me van a permitir que no adelanten muchas de estas conversaciones que vamos a tener con los socios europeos en el próximo Consejo Informal dentro de escasos días en Versalles, en París, bajo la presidencia eh, pro tempore de, de Francia y de la Unión Europea. Eh, en segundo lugar, decirles que desde luego en el Congreso de los Diputados presenté eh, lo que es el esbozo de ese plan nacional de respuesta. Kind of diplomatic options. What do you use to try and cease their, make a ceasefire happen? I mean, realistically, you should be trying to exhaust all of your diplomatic options and like trying to negotiate with Russia in order to commence a, cease, a ceasefire. But historically, the U.S. has not done that, typically. Like, in Afghanistan, for example, when they, uh, when they had the, uh, the opportunity to take Osama bin Laden as a prisoner of war, the U.S. historically turned down the opportunity to take Osama bin Laden and they essentially just said, we don't negotiate with terrorists. And then they bombed the fuck out of Af Afghanistan, even though they had things to, or, or th they had the means to end the fucking senseless violence in Afghanistan. But... Like, this is a lot more, in my opinion, this is a lot more complex than the Afghanistan. Like, a Afghanistan was still very complex, but this situation is a, a lot more complex. Like, because, like, Putin's just a bloodthirsty psychopath who will essentially stop it like nothing, it seems. So, I'm, I, I honestly don't know. But you should be trying to negotiate and finding some method to 
and this senseless violence. Like, nobody wanted this, right? Este pasado lunes eh, me pude reunir con los agentes sociales, sindicatos y empresarios para trasladarles cuáles eran las líneas de actuación eh, que vamos a, a hacer desde el gobierno precisamente para eh, amortiguar el impacto que en el ámbito de los precios, tanto de la energía como también de las materias primas, va a tener esta terrible, esta terrible crisis. Que va a costar, sin duda alguna, pero mayor sería el coste si no actuáramos en contra de Putin, si no actuáramos en contra de quien ahora mismo no solamente está infringiendo la legalidad internacional, sino que está poniendo en cuestión y en riesgo la seguridad de todos los europeos, que es precisamente lo que venimos aquí a garantizar. Esa seguridad en las fronteras europeas, ya sea en Letonia, ya sea en Estonia, ya sea en cualquiera de los países del frente oriental de Europa. Y esa unidad de los aliados y esa unidad también de los europeos me parece ahora mismo trascendental. Y desde luego España, como he dicho en otras muchas ocasiones, could the Russian people vote Putin out of power or is that something or something along those lines I mean my understanding of it is that the U.S. is hoping that the Russian people will overthrow Putin. But realistically, I don't expect that to happen. So, and like, it, it doesn't really matter because like the Russian people, like the Rupal is worth nothing right now. Like, let's just go to... Let's just go to here and then like this is how low the Rupal is right now. Like that is nothing. So the fact that, you know, we're the whole situation with the whole like russia thing like i i honestly don't think that people are going to overthrow him but anything can happen right so it's just more or less of a wait and see thing like and like i honest like for the most part like russian people don't generally like Putin, is from what I understand. But compare the the Rupal to, um, where is it? Uh, the peso, which is, is it any even in here? Uh, I think it's this one, which is like a way, way better, but like, it's just, there's only so much that like we can do right now. It has to more or less do with the civilians in Russia push, uh, pushing back against Putin's fucking bloodthirsty, violent actions and, you know, fucking protesting it, which they have been to what I understand, because, like, Russia right now is, like, fucking black. Like, hardly anything comes out of Russia right now because they decided to fucking hurt the Russians when it came to like the Russian civilians when it came to fucking like really anything. Yeah. Oh. 
Ines Rakņa Latvijas Television Chief Kuri Šoklī. My question to Mr. Sanchez. You already mentioned that you decided to send more troops to Latvia. Could you please be a little bit specific about when they could arrive? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, we, we've been uh, committed <coughs> with uh, Latvia for, for long and with the uh, command of uh, the Canadian Army. Uh, and uh, we are going to deploy, it, uh, as I said before, 150 new uh, soldiers here in, the, in this base. And it's, uh, it's going to be very, very quick, very fast, since uh, uh, the NATO uh, Secretary General, of course, the commander, asked us uh, to. There would have to be a revolution in Russia or anything, any big changes to be made at least. That's what I, that's what I, I mean, that goes for like anywhere though. But, uh, and that's like, that's what a lot of Western countries are hoping that would ha are gonna, is going to happen. But I honestly don't think that it will. What will most likely end up happening is, um, a bunch of senseless violence in Russia against the Russian people who didn't even want this fucking war to begin with. And, like, I honestly don't think that it will happen. And, like, even if that, even if it does happen, there's going to be the consequences of, you know, a fuck ton of people going hungry and, like, not being able to have, like, fucking medicine and shit, right? Because, like, why the fuck would uh, us or any NATO ally send fucking aid to Russia, right? Especially in the, like, even, especially if there was, like, a fucking pushback against the fucking imperialist Russian forces, right? I mean, unless they're fucking Nazis, then... The fucking West will supply the Nazis with fucking weapons, because they always do. We deploy as fast as we can uh, these uh, military units. Well, there's a several points as well. There's the Alpines, Mr. Ron, coming to the Alpine World Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Secretary General. What would NATO do if Vladimir Putin encroached on even one centimeter of NATO's territory? And Mr. Trudeau, would you be willing to go to war? We are here to deter uh, any attack on any uh, NATO allied I mean, like, I don't, I, like, I, Putin's a fucking psychopath, but I don't honestly think he'd encroach on NATO territory. I, I honestly don't think he would, because I think even he knows that uh, that will be nuclear holocaust. That's why he's only fucking attacking Ukraine and not, say, fucking anywhere else in Europe. And, it, like, it's the same thing with, like, establishing a no-fucking-fly zone in Ukraine, either. Like, uh, that would also fucking cause World War Three and nuclear holocaust. Country. And uh, deterrence has helped to preserve peace for more than 70 years. And now we are stepping up to send an even stronger message to uh, President Putin that an attack on one ally... President Putin. From the whole alliance. So we are here to protect every inch of uh, allied territory of Latvia and all other NATO countries. Uh, and the purpose of that deterrence is not to provoke a war, but it is to prevent the war, it is to preserve peace. And uh, I mean, like, I honestly don't think he's going to be attacking Latvia anyways. Like, to my knowledge, I think Latvia is a NATO ally, so he won't. Uh, Putin won't infringe on NATO territory. <sighs> and, like, it's just mostly fucking happening in Ukraine. Like, there, there, I'm sure that there has been proxy wars, like, outside of Ukraine on, like, both fronts, whether it be, like, the Western NATO front or, like, the West or uh, the Russian front. But I don't know. when we see the aggressive actions of uh, President Putin against uh, Ukraine, uh, it has uh, led to the, uh, a big reinforcement of our uh, presence uh, in Latvia and also in other parts of uh, uh, the eastern flank of our alliance. 
and I would like to commend Canada, Spain, uh, and also Latvia as a host nation for really demonstrating <laughs> unity, demonstrating commitment to our collective defense. And uh, as long as we stand together, uh, North America and Europe in NATO, uh, we are all safe because we are uh, by far the strongest alliance in history. And uh, uh, the unity is much stronger than uh, uh, President Putin uh, expected. He wants less NATO, he's getting more NATO. He wanted to divide us, he's getting a more united alliance. So uh, we are here to preserve peace, prevent war, and that's the reason why we are increasing our defensive deterrence presence in uh, Latvia and in the rest of the eastern part of the alliance. Vladimir Putin, uh, Vladimir Putin made a terrible mistake. Sound? Yes. Mike. 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 Vladimir Putin <laughs> made uh, a fundamental miscalculation. He thought Ukraine was weak, and he thought NATO was divided. He's been shown how wrong he is. Ukrainians are strong and courageous and standing up to defend their land. And, like, the crazy thing about, like, the Ukrainians, too, is that it's just not the fucking Ukrainian military, either. You have fucking civilians defending their, uh, their land as well. Like, you have, like, fucking math teachers and fucking doctors picking up arms to fight off against the imperial russian forces so it's just fucking crazy <laughs> like all this fucking death destruction and violence is very fucking unnecessary and nato has never been more united and determined than we all now, we are now, and I know I can speak for all NATO members when I say we will all abide by Article 5. Je peux vous dire que Vladimir Poutine a fait une grave erreur en pensant que les Ukrainiens étaient faibles et que l'OTAN était divisé. Il a vu qu'au contraire, l'Ukraine est très fort et se bat avec un courage incroyable et inspirant. Et il voit aussi que l'OTAN est plus unie que jamais et déterminée à démontrer cette unité à tous les jours. Et je peux parler pour tous les membres de l'OTAN quand je dis que nous allons tous euh, suivre l'article 5. Tobias, mon slide que vous avez pour des issues en catégorie de presse contre ce massacre. So, I honestly think that the troops in Latvia aren't really going to do anything, to be honest. We'll, we'll see about that. It's not Latvia that Putin wants, it's Ukraine that he wants, so it doesn't really make sense for him to invade Latvia. But I guess having the troops there is kind of a good thing. Time will tell. Okay, let's move on to the um the ban on Russian imports of gas and oil. So, let's watch President Brandon ad address the address this a couple phone calls. Today, I'm announcing the United States is targeting the main artery of Russia's economy. We're banning all imports of Russian oil and gas and energy. That means Russian oil Do we have information on why Putin wants Ukraine? Yes, we actually do. And uh, which one is it? Uh, we'll be we'll watch the second thought uh, the second thought video on the Russia Ukraine uh, Ukraine conflict after this because he. He does really good content, and he'll explain why uh, Russia wants uh, Ukraine. I like even if it is hypothetically true that he does want, um, uh, if he does want uh, to rebuild the Russian Empire, like it, it doesn't fucking matter because like. It, it, nothing's gonna ha come out of it anyways. They're gonna be in a worse 
off spot than what they were. The um, but the main reason why I think he wants Ukraine is because Ukraine was turning towards becoming a NATO ally, possibly. And, <clears throat> you know, understandably, since the capital of Russia is very fucking close to Ukraine, they want Ukraine to either be, like, pro-Russian or neutral, so that this way they don't have what they see, what they deem as the enemy, in this instance, NATO, coming and in invading their fucking uh, forces and, pu and pushing their shit in, right? But that doesn't, in my opinion, that doesn't justify this fucking senseless bloodshed. No, no, no. Alright, let's get on to President Brandon and the sanctions on Russian oil and gas, which will most likely be happening here as well. No longer be acceptable at U.S. ports, and the American people will deal another powerful blow to Putin's war machine. This is a move that has strong bipartisan support in Congress and I believe in the country. Americans have rallied support, have rallied to support the Ukrainian people and made it clear we will not be part of subsidizing Putin's war. This made, we made this decision in close consultation with our allies and our partners around the world, particularly in Europe, because a united response to Putin's aggression has been my overriding focus to keep all NATO and all of the EU and our allies totally united. We're moving forward this ban. So, this is going to be a double-edged sword. The main reason why is because with the entire situation uh, of uh, sanctioning Russian oil and gas is that uh, Europe gets a lot of their oil and gas from Russia. So, with that being said, if Russia doesn't like the sanctions that uh, the U.S. and I imagine us as well are putting on uh, on Russia, they could easily cut gas and oil from Europe and not fucking give an, uh, give anything to them so it's it's a very big double-edged sword it could weaken nato allies because it, you know it's fucking winter time of course people are gonna want the fucking heat their houses and shit right so it's just gonna end up it could end up hurting europe more than it actually helps but I think it's a necessary risk that we should be taking just to see what happens and exhaust every single facet when it comes to uh, diplomatic options. And then the U.S. should have uh, an agreement of a ceasefire and all this with Russia to see what, ha what ends up happening understanding that many of our European allies and partners may not be in a position to join us. The United States produces far more oil domestically than all of European all the European countries combined. In fact, we're a net exporter of energy. So we can take this step when others cannot. But we're working closely with Europe and our partners to develop a long-term strategy to reduce their dependence on Russian energy as well. Our teams are actively discussing how to make this happen, and today we remain united, remain united in our purpose to keep pressure mounting on Putin and his war machine. This is a step that we're taking to inflict further pain on Putin, but there will be cost as well here in the United States. I said I would level with the American people from the beginning, and when I first spoke to this, I said defending freedom is going to cost. It's going to cost us as well in the United States. Republicans and Democrats understand alike understand that. Republicans and Democrats alike have been clear that we must do this. Over the last week, I've spoken with President Zelensky several times to hear from him about the situation on the ground and to consult and continue to consult with uh, our European allies and about U.S. support for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. 
Thus far, we've provided more than one billion dollars in security assistance to Ukraine. Come on, Shipments Joe, of defensive wake weapons up. are arriving in Ukraine every day from the United States, and we, the United States, are the ones coordinating the delivery of our allies and partners of similar uh, weapons from Germany to Finland to the Netherlands. We're a com we're we're working that out. We're also providing humanitarian <sighs> support for the Ukrainian people, both those still in Ukraine and those who have fled safely to neighboring countries. We're working with humanitarian organizations to surge tens of thousands of tons of food, water, and medical supplies into Ukraine. And with more on the way. Over the weekend, I sent Secretary Blinken to visit uh, our border between the border between Poland and Ukraine and to Moldova to see what the situation was firsthand and report back. General Milley, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of our Defense Department, is also what was also in Europe, meeting with his counterparts and allies on NATO's eastern flank to reassure them, those countries bordering Russia, NATO countries, that we will keep our NATO commitment, the sacred commitment of Article of Oh, Article God. Five. Brandon Vice is so President boring. President Harris is going to be traveling to meet with the, our allies in Poland and Romania later this week as well. I've made it clear that the United States will share in the responsibility of caring for the refugees so the costs do not fall entirely on the European countries bordering Ukraine. And yesterday I spoke with my counterparts in That's France, good. Germany, and the United Kingdom about Russia's escalating violence against Ukraine and the steps that we're going to take together with our allies and partners around the world to respond to this aggression. We are enforcing the most significant package of economic sanctions in history, and it's causing significant damage to Russia's economy. It has caused Russian economy to, quite frankly, crater. The Russian ruble is now down to 50 percent, by 50 percent since Putin's announced his war. One ruble is now worth less than one American penny. It's worse, it's less e than even that now. As discussed earlier, it's now like 0. 0.000, I think, 36 Canadian. So, it definitely has been hurting the Russian economy for sure, but I'm not too sure. Like, this, I do think this is one of the most important uh, sanctions that uh, the U.S. and and we have, uh, have dished out. But in return, uh, gas prices are going to be going up for sure. Like, there's no doubts about that, even though it only makes up, like, 8% of the fucking uh, multinational corporations that sell fucking gas, like Shell, for example. So, and then they're going to justify it by using fucking this whole sanction nonsense to uh, justify in, uh, increasing the fucking prices of gas which, you know, it's only fucking 8%, like, they can afford a haircut, right? It's just fucking ridiculous. One ruble is less than one American penny. And we're preventing Russia's central bank from propping up the ruble and to keep its value up. They're not going to be able to do that now. We cut Russia's largest banks from the international financial system and has crippled their ability to do business with the rest of the world. In addition... We're choking off Russia's access to technology, like semiconductors that are, and, uh, and sap its, uh, its economic strength and weaken its military for years to come. Major companies are pulling out of Russia entirely without even being asked, not by us. Over the weekend, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, they all suspended their services in Russia, all of them, joining a growing list of American and global companies from Ford to Nike to Apple. They've suspended their operations in Russia. The U.S. stock exchange has halted trading of many Russian securities. The I mean, private sector is united against Russia's vicious war of choice. I mean, I honestly think that's it's mostly just due to pushback because we all know that fucking companies love war because it's so fucking profitable. Like, if if they didn't fucking pull out and like halt stock exchanges and fucking russia there'd be like a lot of fucking pushback so it it only makes sense on why they did of course 
The U.S. Department of Justice has assembled a dedicated task force to go after the, Russian, the crimes of Russian oligarchs. And we're joining with our European allies to find and seize their yachts, their luxury apartments, their private jets, and all their ill-begotten gains to make sure that they share in the pain of Putin's war. These, by the way, are giant. I mean, as much as I have a disdain for the fucking wealthy elite that just sit at, to at the top and do, like, next to fucking nothing outside of, like, publicity stunts, for the most part, they have nothing to do with this, right? This is fucking Putin's war. It has nothing to do with the fucking multinational corporations that are in Russia. And, like, it's just gonna end up hurt, uh, fucking hurting the Russian uh, proletariat more than it's gonna hurt fucking Putin, because he's most likely gonna find some other fucking ways to get money. But I do think that it's, it's at least worth trying to fucking st stop this fucking nonsense. This it's just so stupid. Well, his reasoning is why. Yachts, you put some of them in your press. I mean, some of them are. I think I read one was over 400 feet long. I mean, it's uh, this is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. The decision today is not without cost here at home. Putin's war is already hurting American families at the gas pump. Since Putin began his military buildup on Ukrainian borders, just since then. The price of the gas at the pump in America went up 75 cents. And with this action, it's going to go up further. I'm going to do everything. It's going to go up here a shit ton as well. It could raise from any, like, it's, I think it's like 1.7 a liter right now. And chances are are, are very good. Like, it, it's going to go up to like 1.8. Uh, I've even heard possibly it going up to 2. Uh, two dollars per liter so it's just gonna fucking hurt everyone it's gonna have no fucking benefits and i can to minimize putin's price hike here at home in coordination with our partners we've already announced that we're releasing 60 million barrels of oil from our joint oil reserves half of that 30 billion million excuse me is coming from the united states and we're taking steps to ensure the reliable supply of global energy we're also going to keep working with every tool at our disposal to protect American families and businesses. Now, let, me, let me say this. To the oil and gas companies and to the finance firms that back them, we understand Putin's war against the people of Ukraine is causing prices to rise. We get that. That's self-evident. But, 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 it's no excuse to exercise but. excessive price increases. I mean, like, you already know that they're going to cause excessive price increases. Like, it's it's just going to happen either way. Because that 8% that they get from Russia is apparently very so fucking important that, you know, they're going to fucking bitch and moan about it. And then, you know, it's just going to be fucking nonsensical price hikes. Because they do that. Yep, but... Padding profits or any kind of effort to exploit this situation or, Amer or American uh, consumers, exploit them. Russia's aggression is costing us all. And it's no time for profiteering or price gouging. I want to be clear about what we'll not tolerate. But I also want to acknowledge those firms and oil and gas industries that are pulling out of Russia and joining other businesses that are leading by example. This is a time when we have to do our part and make sure we're not taking, we're not taking advantage. Look, let me be clear about uh, two other points. First, it's simply not true that my administration or policies are holding back domestic energy production. That's simply not true. Even amid the pandemic, companies in the United States pumped more oil during my first year in office than they did during my predecessor's first year. Which is true. He gave so many fucking grants out. Like, it's crazy how many fucking grants he gave out. We're approaching a record levels of oil and gas production in the United States, and we're on track to set a record oil production next year. In the United States... But is that really a good thing, though? Like... You, you claim to be, like, fucking wanting to move forward and pass, like, oil and gas, but you fucking 
give a shit ton of grand soap for drilling. I love the talk of renewable energies, but we <clears throat> we all know that they have no intention of holding themselves for that. I mean, yeah, it's because the fucking uh, oil corp uh, multinational oil corporations make a shit ton of money off of it. And then they end up lobbying our governments to be like, no, no, oil is it's really important that we drill for oil. Just just shut up and take the money. That, that's essentially what it is. And, like, there are other places that actually do have uh, more fucking green and nuclear energy uh, usage. Like, even though, like, some of it has been rolled back, like, most of them, some countries, especially in, like, Europe, for example, are mostly powered by, like, nuclear green energy. And then, outside of that, like, China also has, like, 50% of its uh, fuel consumption coming from nuclear and green, if I remember correctly. 90% of onshore oil production takes place on land that isn't owned by the federal government. And of the remaining 10%, well, yeah, it's because you import a lot of fucking Canadian oil and Saudi Arabian oil. That's where most of your fucking oil comes from, my guy. Why? Like, it just makes it occurs no sense. on federal land. The oil and gas industry has millions of acres leased. They have 9,000 permits to drill now. They could be drilling right now, yesterday, last week, last year. They have 9,000. To drill onshore. Go they green, bitch. Approved. So let me be clear. Let me be clear. They are not using them for production now. That's their decision. These are the facts. We should be honest about the facts. Second, this crisis is a stark reminder to protect our economy over the long term, we need to become energy independent. I've had numerous conversations over the last three months with our European friends of how they have to be wean themselves off of Russian, Russian oil. It's just not. It's just not tenable. And do it, you bitch. Implement a fucking jobs program for green energy. You should have done that like fucking yesterday. It should motivate us to accelerate the transition to clean energy. This is a perspective as then that our European allies share. And the future where together we can achieve greater independence. Loosening environmental regulations or pulling back clean energy investment won't, let me explain, won't, will not lower energy prices. For He's right about that, though. He is 100% right about that. Because getting rid of, or having the fucking private sector control everything is not going to do fucking, it's not going to do shit. What would be the first steps you would take to become a more efficient slash uh, energy efficient slash green uh, energy or country? First of all, what we should be doing is we should be nationalizing our extract in, uh, extraction industries, you know, like gas, oil, lumber, that stuff, right? And then with the funds that we end up gaining from that, not only can we help out the fucking Canadian population and the and the Canadian proletariat with the rising uh, costs of living. We can also, we'd also have a shit ton of money for new technology for, and like investing into green energy. Like even if they don't want to collaborate with some other countries, I'm sure that the EU would gladly give us fucking the information and shit that we need, or even the G7. But it, it's that's that's just the starting point. 
you also have to create a jobs program in order to you know make your fucking solar panels your wind turbines your uh, nuclear reactors whatever the fuck right but that's just a starting point we should also be trying to if we do go through that with that and down that route we should be looking into better ways and more effective ways uh, like fuel effective ways to you know keep that fucking energy and shit for families but transforming our economy to run on electric vehicles powered by clean energy with tax credits to help american families winterize their homes and use less energy that will that will help he's right and about if we that can, if we do what we can it will mean that no one has to worry about the price of the gas pump in the future yeah just just get rid of fucking gas that's problem solved but then you're gonna have like fucking recharge stations like pulling up uh, or raising their fucking money as well That's not good. That's really not good. I mean, tyrants like Putin won't be able to use fossil fuels as weapons against other nations. And it will make America a world leader in manufacturing and exporting clean energy technology of the future to countries all around the world. This is the goal we should be racing toward. Over the last two weeks, the Ukrainian people have inspired the world. And I mean that in a literal sense. They've inspired the world with their bravery, their patriotism, their defiant determination to live free. Putin's war, Putin's war has caused enormous suffering and needless loss of life of women, children, and everyone in Ukraine, both Ukraine and, I might add, Russians. Ukrainian leaders, as well as leaders around the world, have repeatedly called for a ceasefire, for humanitarian relief, for real diplomacy. But Putin seems determined to continue on his murderous path, no matter the cost. Putin's now targeting cities and has been targeting cities and civilians, schools, hospitals, apartment buildings. Solving one more, uh, solving one problem and more show up. I expect there to be, uh, to be uh, a be-all, end-all situation, but in taking the first steps is important. I mean, yeah, but if we do move through or move down the path of green and renewable energy that should be owned by the public and not the fucking private sector last week he attacked the largest nuclear power plant in europe with an apparent disregard for the potential of triggering a nuclear meltdown he has already turned two million ukrainians into refugees Russia may continue to grind out its advance at a horrible price, but this much is already clear. Ukraine will never be a victory for Putin. Putin may be able to take a city, but he'll never be able to hold the country. And if we do not respond to Putin's assault on global peace and stability today, the cost of freedom and to the American people will be even greater tomorrow. So we're going to continue to support the brave Ukrainian people as they fight for their and I call on Congress to pass the $12 billion Ukraine assistance package that I have asked them for uh, of late. The Ukrainian people are demonstrating by their physical courage that they are not about to just let Putin take what he wants. That's clear. They'll defend their freedom, their democracy, their lives. And we're going to keep providing security assistance, economic assistance, and humanitarian assistance. We're going to support them against tyranny. Lethal aid, brother. Violent acts of subjugation. People everywhere, and I, I think it's maybe even surprised some of you all, people everywhere are speaking up for freedom. When the history of this war is written,
Putin's war on Ukraine will have left Russia weaker and the rest of the world stronger. And God bless all those heroes in Ukraine. And now I'm off to Texas. Thank you very, very much. I know there's a lot of I, 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 I know. <laughs> it looks like they just defrosted him from the fucking cryo chamber, man. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions, but there's a lot more that has to be made clear, and I'm going to hold on that until we get more information. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, let's move on to the second thought video on the Russian-Ukraine conflict. You can go over the the conflict way better than I can, so I'm just going to play his video. Uh, I think it was this one, right? Yes. This episode is made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. Fun fact, this is only the second time I've ever released a video late. It's an important topic, and I wanted to cover the conflict from an angle I haven't really seen yet. So I moved some release dates around to get this one out in a timely manner. Anyway, this episode is absolutely going to get demonetized. So if you appreciate the work I'm doing, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Is Putin crazy? Eh, probably. Most yeah. likely at least a little bit. Does it matter? Also yes. That's the short answer for this video that's going to end up being around 20 minutes long. The long answer, well, it's obviously more complicated than that. Let's talk about mainstream coverage of the conflict. Because this situation is fraught and constantly evolving, here's your disclaimer. Hit pause before you start fighting in the comments. You can still see the frost melting from his forehead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, they only, they only let him out of the fucking cryo chamber when he's needed, my guy. So, it's... And then, like, after that, they, they fucking throw him back into the, to the fucking cryo chamber so he doesn't fucking decompose. Like, at least, at least they let Trump out of the fucking basement once in a while, right? <laughs> like, Trump had so much fucking fun. I don't know. Do they freeze him in a suit? Maybe. Sorry, I'm just trying to collect my uh, my composure. Sounded like uh, a family member that was in intensive care just passed away. Okay, let's watch this video and then I'm probably going to stream. And in case you didn't read it, this video isn't going to be defending Putin or Russia. The invasion slash war in Ukraine is unequivocally wrong. Even if you were to take Russia's rhetoric about NATO expansion at face value... W will do. I can... I'm not really too sure that there is anything they'd be able to do, but... We'll, we'll watch this video, and then I'm just going to end stream. I'm going to take, take some time to myself.
you, which, yes, NATO has been kicking the hornet's nest for some time now. This conflict is a dramatic, dangerous, and horrific overreaction. My heart goes out to the people of these two countries who will suffer terribly in a war they did not want. In this episode, I'm going to try and answer a couple of questions. Like the one in the title, Is Putin Crazy? But I'll mostly be looking into why that question gets asked in the first place, how useful it is, both in the short and the long term, and what focusing on that question leaves out of the picture. This video is going to try to understand this whole situation a little bit better without getting into the specific details of the conflict. We're not going to rehash the whole history of Ukraine or Russia. We're not going to go into the details about Euromaidan or Crimea. Those are very, very complex situations. Uh, I think he should do a, an own, uh, a separate video on entirely because the... It's very, very complex with the uh, fucking former Soviet unions. Uh, with, there's 